My story of midlife and menopause is probably not unlike yours. The midsection fluff came from nowhere. I was tired and achy. Not sure why I waited so long, but I did get coaching, but only after looking at the multitude of programs out there on the market. You don't have to spend a lot of money, do crazy workouts, or buy a bunch of special food to get results. Let me show you how. My six-week group program starts every few Mondays, and I promise by week two, you will feel better, and by week four, you will start to see body changes. By week eight, other people will want to know what you're doing. This is not a diet. It's a lifestyle with sustainable results. Are you ready to invest in you? I'm happy to get on a call to explain the Faster Way program or just check out the info in the show notes. You can even send me a DM on Instagram. I can't wait to work together. Health, wellness, fitness, and everything in between. We're removing the taboo from what really matters in midlife. I'm your host, Michelle Folan, and this is Asking for a Friend. As things are rapidly changing and progressing in the realm of hormone replacement therapy and women's health in general, it's sometimes difficult staying current on all the latest and greatest in order to make the best decisions for our health. But how do we cut through the confusion? My mission is to arm my listeners with information so we can do our own research and feel empowered to have discussions with our healthcare providers. There is a lot of noise out there, ladies, and today we're going to chat with Dr. Nicole Lovett about all things hormones and weight loss. She returns to asking for a friend after her top listen to episode in 2023, and I'm super excited to have her back for round two. Welcome to Asking for a Friend, Dr. Nicole Lovett. Thanks. Happy to be here. I appreciate being invited back. You know, now that I'm doing the math, you may have been expecting last time you were on the show because you have a new baby. Yes. We welcomed our son in December of last year. He's turning six months this weekend. Oh, well, congratulations. That's fantastic. Thank you. I know who you are, and if anyone had heard the the podcast with you last year, they certainly are familiar with you. But I think it'd be nice to just get everybody caught up on uh, where you're from, like your schooling, and where your practice is. Sure. So I was born and raised in Winnipeg, Canada. I took my training at University of Manitoba. Initially, my undergrad degree was biochemistry and physics, a double honors program. Then I went into medical school and I was recruited into the clinician scientist program where you do your medical degree at the same time as a PhD. And my chosen area was uh, pharmacology and therapeutics. So it was drug science, specifically in women's health, female physiology, pregnancy, and metabolism. And so that's sort of my background. I then trained in residency in Canada and eventually moved to the States in 2018 because I married an American. (laughs) Good reason. Yeah. (laughs) Our practice is based out of the Midwest, and we have uh, two locations in North Dakota and one in Washington State. Oh, wow. How do you manage that? I'm optimized. (laughs) (laughs) You're optimized. (laughs) That's putting it mildly. Or or do we we call that spread thin? I have a good team and uh, we have really, you know, rock solid providers. And Okay, that's great. And so that's new because since we spoke last year, you've also added a practice. Yes, we purchased a building in Fargo, North Dakota, and we opened that this year. And we just hired a full-time nurse practitioner, Nicole, who started June 1st at that practice. Your practice has evolved to really meet the needs of midlife women. I think Mm -hmm. that's fair to say. What drives you to keep offering more services in that realm? I think it's extremely rewarding to introduce therapies to someone's life that actually make them feel better and work in 95% of your patients. It's sort of like having a magic bullet. You're like, I know I can get you to sleep on progesterone. I know I can give you more energy. And so instead of sort of shooting in the dark with synthetic medications I've used in the past before hormones where maybe 10 to 20% respond, so many more of my patients respond well to this treatment. So it's very rewarding to have those follow-ups and start those consults. I have to backtrack a little bit because you did tell me a really cool story that 
this wasn't the path that you originally had chosen. You had gone to a seminar on on hormones and like right before you were getting ready to open your primary care practice. Can you tell that story a little bit? Because this is actually fascinating. So I've always been interested in pharmacology. Clearly, I did the PhD in that area. And I was at a filler conference two weeks before we opened to do an advanced anatomy course on a cadaver. And I ran into a colleague there and we started talking about how the dietary guidelines aren't good for people and um, a lot of the downsides to a lot of the mainstream medications. And he's, I asked him where he had received his hormone training. He said, okay, you need to go get, go to this course. And it just so happened there was a, a course the following weekend. And so I signed up for it and went through all the stages of grief, realizing I knew exactly what to do now for myself and a lot of the female patients that were sort of, everything's normal. You're, you must be busy. You must just be getting to that age. I knew how to treat them now. And so we, I talked to my husband and I said, we have to change what we're doing. And we pivoted to hundred percent weight loss hormone therapy. Okay. Yeah. I think that's great. And certainly your clientele, that population is growing every day. I do want to talk about HRT. Mm -hmm. We could probably do a whole show on just that topic. What are the current recommendations for women in perimenopause and menopause? It depends who you ask. If you look at ACOG or other OBGYN groups, they will say you should be on the least amount of hormones for the least amount of time. And they're using studies based on synthetic hormones. In my opinion, if you're in perimenopause and you have any symptoms of low progesterone, like hot flashes, insomnia, night sweats, anxiety, irritability, you should be on the progesterone dose that cushions that transition as much as possible. So you don't end up with relationship issues or needing antidepressants or other interventions. If you have any symptoms of thyroid, like feeling cold when you're not having a hot flash, constipation, fatigue, weight gain, a thyroid hormone can play a role too in that transition in improving your quality of life. And then we often think of menopause as the time where all of our hormones are gone, but we actually lose testosterone at a much younger age. And so in perimenopause, you can replace testosterone to help with libido and preserving sexual function. And then when you transition into menopause, that's when you finally lose the estrogen, when that becomes important to replace to preserve your metabolism and your bone health. So if I were in perimenopause, you would then maybe use progesterone and testosterone without estrogen. Correct. Yeah. So the big distinguishing factor of whether you can use estrogen is whether you're in full menopause or not. If you're not in full menopause, we don't use estrogen um, because it can have very unpredictable results because your own ovaries are still making it. And one of the big hormonal changes in perimenopause that gives you the high estrogen to begin with is a loss of the hormone inhibin that controls estrogen production. So you're kind of putting gasoline on a fire possibly by giving estrogen before that menopausal state. Ah, okay. I get it now. So when you do prescribe, say, progesterone and testosterone, are you doing levels or are you basically assessing based on symptoms? Both. So there's kind of two major groups of women, women with low progesterone. They aren't making it anymore. They've transitioned close enough to menopause that they just don't make progesterone anymore. And then there's women that might have underlying PCOS that have progesterone resistance. So they might be still making some, but the, when the hormones binding the receptor, it doesn't create as much of a signal. So you can think of a stone skipping on a lake. If you have resistance, if the water's really thick, the stone won't make much of a bounce. So when that progesterone receptor gets bound, the signaling cascade is not as intense or pronounced. So they get less of an effect from the same level. So they might need a much higher level for the same benefits. Okay. Got it. Can you talk about the short-term and long-term benefits of being on estrogen? So I'm, I'm 60 years old. I am on oral estrogen mm -hmm. and I also have osteoporosis. What else besides bone health are we looking at now in regard to the benefits of estrogen? So if you're looking at oral estradiol, you generate metabolites in your liver from the blood from your stomach going to your liver next that produces metabolites that will actually eat plaque in your arteries that you formed since menopause or during your 40s. It raises good cholesterol, HDL. It lowers triglycerides, lowers blood sugars, 
lowers insulin, which results in reduced visceral fat. So you're looking at major disease prevention for Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes. It also has a central role in the, in the brain in terms of improving sex drive centrally and sexual function, such as your central nervous system regulation of orgasm versus anything in the pelvis. It keeps the part of your brain that regulates your balance healthy so that you would be less likely to develop balance issues as you age. And then in the brain, it also reduces appetite. So a lot of women will get much more cravings for sweets and salty foods after menopause, and that will, estrogen will reduce those. And then you're talking about a major improvement in bone density. So instead of losing two or 3% a year, you gain two to 3% of your bone density back. So if we look at women that go into menopause, the quicker you can get them on the estrogen, the better they do, because they're not going to spend years losing bone density that they have to then regain. Okay. How long can I be on estrogen? Until your funeral. Okay. I, I'm so glad you said that because I will tell you right now, you're, you're not going to pry it out of my cold, dead hands. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going off of it. And I think that is such a change that women need to hear. That whole thought process has absolutely shifted. The patch, the estradiol patch versus oral. Yeah. What do you prefer and is there a difference? So there's this thought in the medical community that oral estradiol can cause blood clots. No study has ever shown that. Whenever there's been a blood clot finding involving estrogen, there's always been a sidekick, synthetic progesterone. That's actually the, the hormone causing the blood clots. So progestins are prothrombotic because they increase insulin resistance and increase your clotting risk. Oral estradiol does not. In fact, they've done studies on women with clotting disorders and they clot at the same rate, whether they're on oral estradiol or not. So how could it? And then when you look at other studies that measure clotting cascade factors like fibrinogen, those markers in the blood improve on oral estradiol. So again, how could it cause blood clots? But that's the main reason why people are scared of oral estradiol is like, well, it could give a blood clot to someone. And it's just not the case. It's a different hormone than the one that does do that. So that's why a lot of people will choose transdermal because like, well, I don't want to get into trouble with a blood clot. Because if somebody gets a blood clot and they're on oral estradiol and they go to the ER, the ER doctor's been taught, well, that's what caused the blood clot, even though that's not what the literature says. So that's the main reason why it's not used. I only use oral estradiol unless I have a very you know compelling reason not to. And the most compelling reason would be somebody with a history of blood clots that is themselves not convinced that it couldn't cause that. And then, okay. then I'll say, okay, then you, you can get the transdermal. It won't work as well. You're missing out on the first pass metabolism with the transdermal. So, you know, I mentioned you swallow the estrogen and it goes to your liver, it gets chopped into pieces. When you have a patch, there's no ingestion. So you don't send that hormone through your liver for that first pass metabolism. So you don't get a lot of the metabolites that'll improve cardiovascular um, outcomes. Okay. All right. I'm feeling, I'm feeling really good right now yes. about my oral estradiol. Have you noticed a big improvement going on to the oral? Well, I was on vaginal before. Oh, yeah. I'm just on vaginal. So I have to tell everybody the story because this is really pretty good. Last year after you and I spoke, I took copious notes because I was so intrigued by everything that you were saying. I show up at my, my GYN appointment you know, talking to my nurse practitioner, and I had a list for her. <laughs> I think she was probably like, back it down, sister. You're get, you're a little too excited here. But I went from vaginal estradiol to oral. I got put on progesterone, and I was already doing topical testosterone because I, w I was um, post-hysterectomy. Yeah. So I really feel like talking to you really set me on a much better path. And can I tell the difference? Absolutely. And I haven't had my bone density done yet. I or the, the second, right? The follow-up because mm -hmm. I just had the, the first one done a year ago, but I am very curious to see if there are some improvements there. Yeah, I did have blood work done in September of last year and all of my metrics, all of my biomarkers improved. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was 
really great to hear. Your provider can measure your bone turnover using um, a blood test as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Used to be n telopeptide. They don't offer that anymore. And I believe it's a, it's called CTX. Um, CTX, right. They can measure. And if it's a ele- higher range of normal, you have high bone turnover and it's more, it changes sooner than the bone density will. Cause you can say, oh, look, your bone turnover is low. That's good. All right. I, I just, I just wrote that one down. I did get a question from a listener about progesterone. Yeah. Do you always recommend that progesterone be added to estrogen therapy? Yes. So again, going back to synthetic hormones, the school of thought is if you have a uterus, you need to oppose estrogen with progesterone. But if you've had a hysterectomy, you don't need progesterone. But if you still have your ovaries, ovaries are sensitive to estrogen. And if you have breasts, which most women have, those are also sensitive to estrogen. So you want to oppose the estrogen in all the estrogen sensitive tissues to have balanced receptor signaling. And progesterone is so good at promoting deep sleep, rest, uh, reducing anxiety, that it's a very good hormone to be on just for quality of life. As you know, lots of women in menopause don't sleep very well, and that's because they lost their progesterone and you can replace that for them. I don't care if you have a uterus or not, you still have a brain that could use it or breasts that could. Who should not take oral estrogen or use the patch? Is Where are we now on the whole uh, realm of cancer? Well, if you look at the oncology literature, estrogen is, whether it's synthetic or bioidentical, is protective against breast cancer recurrence and lowers the risk of breast cancer, in addition to lowering your risks of heart attack, stroke, diabetes, dementia. There's a big paper that just came out this year talking about the protectiveness of estrogen in breast cancer and recurrence. But if you ask the oncology community, they say it's what causes breast cancer. But that doesn't really make sense because we get it at a life stage when we have abnormal estrogen regulation, not when we're young and fertile for the most part. Most breast cancer is menopausal. So it really just depends. Um, Dr. Rousier, it has to be careful with how he teaches this topic. He says, you know, if it was my wife or my daughter or me or mine, then obviously this is how you would treat this type of cancer, but you can't really treat patients with it. Yeah. So it's sort of a, it's a sad part of medicine that I think is being mismanaged right now. I don't know a lot about breast cancer, but there's like estrogen positive, like HER2, uh, progesterone. HER2, yeah. So if we look at breast cancer cells, they, they have various receptors that they're positive for. Every cell has, for the most part, an insulin receptor, and we don't talk about how insulin is the cause of cancer too. It's actually insulin resistance and an estrogen imbalance across the cell that feeds the breast cancer. And if you give high doses of estrogen, you restore the insulin resistance and then you get rid of the cancer. And progesterone and testosterone are both apoptotic to breast cancer, i.e. when they bind, if a breast cancer binds that hormone, it it commits suicide, basically, the cell. So high doses of testosterone and progesterone can also help but that patient has to really step outside their oncologist recommendations to want a treatment like that. And often they're spouses of hormone doctors or family members of providers that know that this isn't how you would treat it if it was you. But a lot of patients don't get that treatment because it's too risky Yeah, because the whole oncology community doesn't support it. How about using estrogen creams on the face? So estriol, uh, there are some companies out there, My Alloy and Muesli, they make these creams that have, you know, an estrogen base to them. Can we use our, say, our vaginal estrogen? Can we use that on our face? <laughs> you could. Um, Estriol is not terribly potent. It, it's, uh, it's sort of one of the lower potency estrogens. You're way further ahead to take oral estradiol and you'll get the cosmetic benefits and combine it with testosterone and get even more cosmetic benefits like cellulite reduction and wrinkle reduction than using the cream. But if that's the only thing you have, I guess you could. <laughs> okay. I had to ask that because that was a question I got from a listener. And I thought it was a really good question mm-hmm. because we all, a lot of us have a tube of that in mm-hmm. our bathrooms and when we use it on our faces. All right. I didn't think there'd be any harm in it, but I, mm-hmm. I thought I better ask. 
Dr. Lovett, low libido is a huge topic, and you, we've covered this many times on the podcast. You say you're using testosterone with success. How are you dosing that? Are you, is it topical or pellets? What's what's yeah. the current thought process? So you, mo- I, I use topical with daily application um, for most women. The pellets, I think they have a role. If I was elderly and stuck in a nursing home and that's the only way I could get my testosterone, I would get a pellet because my family could break me out once every three to six months for it. Um, <laughs> but for the average person, the cream, you're going to get a much stable, more stable level. You're not going to have that up and down where you feel gr- like superwoman for six weeks during the pellet, but then you're kind of coming up or going down from that feeling. And then you also have no control once you place the pellet. If it's too much for the patient, they can get a lot of hair loss and acne and maybe a libido that's destructively good. And they're they're stuck. They have to ride it out because you can't take it out. The transdermal creams, we can go from very low concentration to quite a good high concentration. So you can dial it up very slowly. And then there's women, like I have a young baby at home that might I might, might not want to risk any contamination of the cream spreading to him. So you can also use injections in women like twice a week or three times a week with a, a testosterone oil. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I have not heard that before. Mm-hmm. The risk of transferring the topical onto somebody else, is is that a real possibility? It's more so with the male cream and if they're not washing their hands really well. Because I have plenty of men that have are on treatment with a high dose male cream and their wives have no testosterone in their systems. When I t- check their levels, I'm like, okay, he's not spreading it at all. Whereas other <laughs> other men, you know, there's been case studies of precocious puberty in the children of men that are putting cream on because they're not washing their hands well, or they're sleep, cope sleeping with their children right after putting the cream on. So it's more women that are more a little paranoid that I just don't want even a little bit of a chance. And I get that because you know, it's your baby and you don't want to oh, yeah. them a pro- no. just puberty. <laughs> no, God, no. And then where do you typically have patients apply the cream? The best place for the sexual benefits and the tightening of the pelvic floor is the labial area, outer labia. And they're going to get all the sexual benefits from the testosterone. And then they're going to get some of the estrogen benefits that you would normally expect from a cream like lubrication and um, prevention of UTIs, your urinary tract infections. Okay. That's fascinating. Yeah. You know, you told me last year to use the testosterone around the labia and I didn't know why, (laughs) but now I do. All right. I didn't ask. I just said, okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We've touched on a little bit about the hormone connection and weight. And I know GLP-1s are all the buzz these days. I mean, you hear the commercials, you know, every time you turn on the radio, the TV, can you just first get into the mechanism of action of how these GLP-1 drugs work? So the main mechanisms, there's a few of them. They increase insulin sensitivity. So they improve the insulin resistance that's underlying a lot of weight gain. They increase satisfaction from food. So you feel full faster and they also slow down how quickly your stomach can empty. So whatever you do eat sits there longer so you feel full. Um, It also interrupts some reward pathways between the gut and the brain where you get a rush from eating a donut. You don't get that rush when you're on the medication for the most part. So you're much less likely to want to eat it because you're not getting the dopamine from it. The problem is, is you, they're not being used in my opinion in the right order. So I, I truly believe that you have to optimize the patient's naturally occurring hormones first and also teach them how to eat before you use a tool like that, because you're setting them up for failure. The body is able to compensate for calorie restriction very quickly within months. And so you have patients that don't lose any weight or they lose very little because their body is compensating by slowing their thyroid down a little bit more, slowing their metabolism down. And so you end up with this, you know, miracle cure for obesity that's not working. And then your metabolism is that much more deranged by the time we can fix the other hormones and restart that medication. And if you use the weight loss shots 
as a tool, but you don't change your diet and you're eating popcorn and chips and cake on it instead of protein, you get a lot of malnutrition. You lose fat in your face. You look unhealthy. You have a lot of sagging skin and you don't have the protein that you need to keep any of your muscle, which is the big downside to this drug is loss of muscle. May I just say three cheers for Dr. Lovett. I am so appreciative of your perspective on this because I'm a health coach now and I have a client who has been on these drugs and she gained all her weight back plus some. Mm -hmm. And I was explaining to her, I said, you know, when we lose a dramatic amount of weight, up to 30% or more, that can be muscle. Yeah. And I love what you said about eating protein and what about lifting weights and making sure we're getting a lot of resistance exercise in. So my ideal treatment plan for either men or women is to get them on, optimize their thyroid if needed and testosterone if possible, because that will help them preserve more of their lean muscle. And then I do want them to be trying to do weight bearing exercises to keep their muscle and then trying to get a gram of protein per pound of body weight. So I'm like, kind of like, even if you're not hungry, you need to get, you need to hit that protein target because if you don't, there's a set point in your brain in the hypothalamus that says this person needs to weigh X pounds. And if you don't influence that set point with hormone therapy, like testosterone and thyroid, you can compensate, your body will compensate to get you back to that set point. So you are using these drugs in your practice. Are you doing the name brand or are you doing a compounded formula? If a patient's insurance will cover the commercial, then we'll use that. Otherwise we have compounded. It's a lot less cost prohibitive for the patient to use the compounded. And we have various pharmacies we can get that from and it's high quality stuff and it works well. I would say only about maybe one in four, or one in five of my patients ends up on that medication and they don't usually stay on it. We like, we use it as a tool and then they come off. Okay. Have you heard about microdosing? Mm -hmm. So using a compounded formula and then microdosing, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So the idea is um, if you're getting toxicity from a drug because of the peak in the valley, so you, you're throwing up for three days after your shot, but you feel fine for four days. Then if you take that same dose and you split it up into a daily injection, your peak never gets as high. You stay below that threshold that you're going to feel sick, but you still get some of the benefits of the insulin resistance and the impaired reward pathways. So you could say, let's say if you're going to take, if you're supposed to take 14 units a week, you take two units a day instead, you divide it by seven. Other people will do like twice a week injections. Instead, they'll take their weekly dose and divide it into two. I do that with some patients that are having, that can't tolerate the full dose all at once. How long can we be on these drugs? We don't know. They haven't been around like a full human lifespan yet. So there's a lot of bad things in the media about them too, like stomach paralysis and, you know, there's mental health things that are coming out now. But I think a lot of these really bad side effects are because the patient's thyroid levels are crashing to compensate for the drug to get the weight back on. And so you're getting like constipation and heartburn and depression because your thyroid levels are going down. And I just don't see really that in my patients because we've done it the other way around. So smart. I would love to talk about the thyroid because you had recommended last year that I get my thyroid tested, but you were very specific in the test that I asked for. And I don't recall what that was. And I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> sure. So generally at your primary care office, we check TSH and we stop there. The TSH is a measure of what your brain is telling your thyroid to do. And if that's out of range, then we get levels. There's a great deal of evidence out there that anything, a TSH outside of the range of one to two naturally occurring, like that's your baseline is probably, you're probably working too hard. We might want to call that hypothyroidism when the, when the new guidelines come out. That being said, you want to know what you're actually making as well. So I measure free T3, which is active thyroid, and free T4, which is the storage thyroid. And then I may or may not order a reverse T3 level. Reverse T3 is a compensatory mechanism. I, I usually tell my patients that it's if you're an Irish peasant running from the English, you activate that pathway so you can get fat on 300 calories a day. That's what it does for you. It blocks your receptor for T3, and it lowers your TSH to help you make less thyroid to get your metabolism to be in survival, mo in survival mode. Inflammation also does that chronic fasting that's too aggressive, that kind of stuff. And then you may or may not want to explore antibody testing 
So if you have autoimmune disease history, lots of p- patients in their family have uh, uh, Hashimoto's or Graves, the antibody testing can just give you another layer of, well, do I have an underlying autoimmune that I'm losing thyroid tissue from my Hashimoto's or am I having complications from my Graves disease? Because it's the Graves antibodies that cause the complications that are attributed to a low TSH. It's actually Graves disease patients and they have certain antibodies that attack their bone, their heart. And so it's good if you're having symptoms of that illness to know that you have it. So you can say, well, that's why I'm going to get thyroid eye disease, or that's why I might get AFib. It's my antibodies, not the thyroid hormone. Okay. This always blows my mind when I talk to you. I was, it's like, I got like, to take a minute here. What I appreciate so much about your approach is that it really is a multi-pronged approach. Yeah. You don't just have an obese patient or someone that wants to lose weight in front of you. You're looking at the entire story there. And you're really, what you're really saying here is that thyroid is really at the root of a lot of stuff. And what we have now in our environment, we've never had so many endocrine disrupting chemicals that affect thyroid, like the pesticides and herbicides on our lawns, the flame retardants on our furniture, the microplastics, the BPA, the phthalates, they all affect thyroid hormone. And so we're constantly being immersed in an environment that's disrupting thyroid function. I personally think that it has to be contributing to our obesity epidemic. Has has all of this changed how you live, like how you're managing your your home and your personal? We try to minimize things that you can control. We use reverse osmosis water. Um, we try to eat organic when we can. We get meat from a farm that we know is good quality. But at the end of the day, you go on an airplane, you hang out in an airport lounge, you stay at a hotel. You can't, it, there's there's just so, only so much you can do to control that. Yeah. How often should we be getting our thyroid tested? I think it, it depends on who's testing it. I've had most of my patients that are 35 or older have had their TSH tested probably 10 times by the time they hit my door. And they've been told it's normal, so we're not going to do anything. You need to get it tested once by the right person. And then the TSH really doesn't matter too much. Because again, there's a, a, a cultural thing in medicine that low, a low TSH is dangerous. But if you look at the medical literature, a low TSH is associated with Graves and Graves is dangerous. It's not. We know that in women without or men without Graves disease, when we use suppressive doses of thyroid hormone, we don't see osteoporosis, we don't see AFib, we don't see the what the people are worried about would happen with a low TSH. If you're not having any symptoms, would we still test? No, symptoms are fatigue, weight gain, cold extremities, an inappropriately low resting heart rate. When you're younger, an inappropriately low blood pressure, you can have constipation, depression, So, I mean, there's a lot of thyroid symptoms that could, a lot of people fit the bill with that. Um, And so sometimes we'll do a trial of therapy. What that means is your TSH is normal, but your levels look kind of low for your age and you're having a lot of symptoms. We'll give you thyroid hormone. If all of your symptoms get better, that's a success. And that's what most, most patients tell me, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. If they don't, well, we tried. It was a trial of thyroid optimization. And there's no permanent damage from taking thyroid temporarily. Your thyroid goes right back to what it was making before. I would love to ask you what one of your core pillars of self-care is. Protein. (laughs) So, (laughs) yay. Yes. Even if it's convenience, like I have to buy pre hard boiled eggs at Costco and packaged, you know, proteins like that because I'm too busy. I really try to get that in and I never forget my thyroid. (laughs) Okay. So thyroid and protein. How much protein are you taking every day? I don't measure it anymore, but I will get it when I get off a night shift, I'll have like a big steak with an avocado or hamburger patties just with salt and pepper, that kind of stuff, hard boiled eggs. Okay. Yep. I I love I love that. I'm trying to get to 120 to 130 grams per day. With the osteoporosis and being Mm -hmm. 60 and wanting to be able to 
do stuff when I'm 80, you know, all of that. Dr. Nikki Lovett, where can people find you? The best place would be either on our website or social media. So we have a website where you can email in your request for a consultation, and then our clinic director will sort people to the right provider, or you can get reach out to us on social media as well. Okay. And is it, it's Firefly Medical, correct? Yeah. Fireflymedical.net is the website and it's at Firefly Medical for social media. Perfect. Yeah. Dr. Lovett, it was great seeing you again. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for being here. Follow Asking for a Friend on social media outlets and provide a review and share this show wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews and sharing help us grow. 